Hello, Free Fromers, and welcome to Series 2, Episode 4 of the Allergy and Free From Chat with me, Ben Corbett. We're back with two more guests and a cook-along. On today's show, we welcome Stacey Forsey, have a cook-along with Becky XL. But first, I'd like to invite to the virtual studio, Free From advocate and indeed pioneer, Michelle Berrydale Johnson. Hi, hello, Ben. Hello, everybody. Hi, Michelle. Hi, so thanks so much for giving up your time to come and have a chat today. Pleasure, always. <laughs> no worries. So um, for anyone that might be new to the Free From community, could you tell our viewers a little about yourself and what you do and what, they, what you might be known for? Yeah, I certainly can. Well, I've been probably involved in Free From, well, actually, since long before the term Free From was even invented. Um, 35 years ago, my son's now 35, he was dairy intolerant and I was a foodie, I had run catering businesses, I wrote historical cookery books, so it was obviously interesting and so I started looking around at the, uh, you know, what, what could you get for somebody who's on a dairy-free diet, because actually his dad was as well, so, you know, we had become a dairy-free household. And we're talking about 1988, 89, and there okay, was yeah. nothing. There was <laughs> nothing. Well, no, that's not strictly true. There was, there was some soya milk, which tasted like liquid chalk, and mm -hmm. that was about it. And so I thought, oh, come on, we can do better than that. So we started off literally by manufacturing products, um, 1889 okay. and 90, uh, but it was way, way too early. I mean, nobody knew what we were even talking about. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, certainly, we did miraculously, we made an ice cream, a soy based ice cream, which was incredibly virtuous and didn't even have any kind of any gums or anything in it. Uh, we did a range of ready meals and we did some dairy free chocolates. And we actually did manage to get them all into the supermarkets in one tiny little kind of square like that. I mean, you know, it was never viable at that point because nobody actually even knew what we were talking about. But we'd started a newsletter to back the products A newsletter grew into a magazine. And at one point, we were actually distributing it free to about 35,000 health professionals because my, in my sweet innocence, I thought, ah, oh, we'll tell the world about food intolerance. You know, we'll explain to them what it's all about. Um, little did I know that 30 years later, I'd still be trying and hadn't got a great deal further. So we, we then turned it into a subscription magazine for uh, people with food problems of all kinds, not just allergies, but also you know, all the other 10,000 intolerances that I know that all of your listeners and all your, your viewers know all about, for which there's very little help. There wasn't then. There's not a lot more now. Um, so we were then a, a magazine. And then, of course, you know, the Internet came along. So the magazine turned into a website. So we then had this massive big website, Foods Matter, which is still up there, which has uh, well, I, I've long since lost track of how many pages, but a massive amount of information. And Along with that, at the same time, the uh, whole kind of free from food world was beginning to come about. And it was very much helped by the fact that the Internet was just getting underway. So, you know, you, you have celiac disease. You can't find anything to eat. So you make a cake. You think, oh, it's really good. You work on it. You get a really nice gluten free cake. And then your friends say, hey, that's brilliant. I really like it. Um, you could sell that. So you start selling it. But way back in the day when we started manufacturing things, the only way you could do that was through a wholesaler or direct to the supermarkets. But now, of course, with the Internet, everybody was able to start a little website and they could mail order it. And so there was a great explosion in, in free from food, really, starting probably around the turn of the century, but certainly getting up to kind of 2010. So at that point, we thought, well, what else could we do to kind of move this whole thing along? And somebody came up with the idea of awards. So in 2008, we started the Free From Food Awards. And it was quite exciting because it was such a new industry. And, you know, for everyone in the industry, hey, you know, we're a proper industry. We've got awards of our own. Yeah. And so they've just been hugely successful. We're now in year 14. Um, we just had a massive, great rebrand. Yeah, uh, this is our new logo. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can see for the moment, because on Monday, when the awards open, the new website will be unveiled. And we're moving moving into a whole new world. It's it's really exciting stuff. Um, we had our, our first, well, no, our second, actually, Zoominar, which is kind of online and networking event yesterday, which went really, really well. And we're just now all very excited about this year's awards and about the whole, you know, the possibilities and where Free From is going. It's all very exciting stuff. 
Amazing. I mean, I know that uh, how important it is the the free from food awards. It's something on, as far as the free from calendar goes. It's something we all look forward to, and people wear the the logo with a, as a badge of honor when they win something. And um, I, I know that we'd be keen to, you know, I think you're going to come back on and we're going to do a proper free from food awards special a little further yeah, down the line and bring Cressida mm-hmm. that you work with on online as well. And Absolutely. yeah, that'll be really good. Really good yeah. to chat through that and, and an exciting time if you're launching something new. Mm, very exciting and there are constantly new stuff coming up that's what's so great about every year we find all these wonderful new products some survive some don't but you know there's an awful lot out there i think that um some someone like myself who obviously is well not obviously because i've never told you i'm gluten sensitive uh, and i sort of forget quite how lucky I am and hearing sort of about when you first became involved with free from food and stuff uh it I was going to ask you, what did you feel was the biggest barrier to overcome at that point? But from what you're saying, it sounds like all of them. <laughs> like, like food? <laughs> it was just yeah, like, yeah. I mean, really, you know, if you get think back to people who are celiac, you know, celiac disease was discovered at the end of the, the last world war. And for people who are celiac, there actually was nothing. You basically had to create for yourself. There was nothing. You know, there, there were breads, the, the dreaded valpiform bread, which came in a round tin. You've got this funny little round tin and, and it bore very little resemblance to bread. Now, I know bread is incredibly difficult and making really good gluten-free bread is still an issue for lots of people. But nonetheless, there was absolutely nothing then. I mean, today, people with food allergies just don't know how lucky they are. There are so <laughs> many possibilities and so many products now which are not just gluten-free, okay, that sorts it out for you. But well, about four years ago, I think, we started a new category in the awards. We thought, let's give it a whirl, with no, none of the top 14 allergens. And we thought, oh, I don't know, you know, we'll, we're lucky. If we get five entries, that'll be great. You know, there's something out there. We were absolutely gobsmacked. We had, I think, something like about 40 plus entries in the very first year. And that's still one of our biggest categories. That's with not one of the top 14 allergens in there, which is incredible, that's isn't amazing. it? That's Just amazing. Brilliant. That's amazing. Mm. I'm, I'm really interested that you said earlier that sort of the turn of the century was a big sort of a big sea change in terms of, uh, I, I, was, I was wondering what you thought was the driving force behind that at that time. Was it information? Was it choice? Was it understanding? What do you think drove that change at the turn of the century? I think there were, there were a lot of things. I mean, there were realistically a lot of, there the was more allergy around, you know. The, the big question is always, what, were they just being more diagnosed or was there actually more allergy around? Well, no, there definitely is. I mean, when I was a kid, which is admittedly a very long time ago, but when I was a kid, you know, peanut allergy never even been heard of. I mean, absolutely, completely unheard of. And even, you know, when, when my son was at school in the, in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, it was still relatively rare. We're now looking at, you know, one child in every 45 has peanut allergy. Um, And, you know, so the actual incidence of allergy has certainly increased. There was also a much more, I think, you know, after the war, the food in the UK was fairly terrible. And it took a long time for people really to get their heads around food. You probably heard of Elizabeth David and all the kind of things that happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It was a long time for people to get their heads around food. And to then get their heads around the fact that food and health were, were so closely involved with each other and that actually what you ate did affect your health. And so there was much more awareness, I think, around the, you know, the turn of the century about the importance of food. People were starting to become aware of, of kind of intolerances, things like, for example, goat's milk, you know, milk. So many children have, have you know, babies uh, find difficulty tolerating formula milks. But maybe that for all kinds of different reasons. But people were starting to look at goat's milk and sheep's milk and alternatives there and realize that, that okay, they, they were not good if you had a very serious allergy, but they might be good if you had an intolerance. There were all kinds of, you know, gradations to all of this. And so I think there was a very much more of an interest. And gradually people came to think that maybe if you started cutting these things out, you would be eating more healthily, which sometimes you were. I mean, there was a bit of a misapprehension to begin with, with the um, the early free from foods, which were not necessarily that healthy, because in a desperate attempt to put some kind of flavor in, you know, people tend to chuck in a lot more sugar and fat and, and salt and things. That has improved immensely over the last mm. 10 years. I mean, the nutritional, the nutritional profile of the foods that are entered into the awards these days is fantastic. 
you know, I can remember we were, probably about 10 years ago, we printed out a massive great sheet with all the E numbers, everything. And so during the judgings, we'd always be referring back to evil and whatever it was, because no, 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 there were so many additives and everything in all these products. I think if we refer to that sheet once, in a judging of over 500 products these days, that would probably be it. So the you know the awareness of nutrition in free from foods is hugely much better now. So I think all of these things came together. As I say, also people starting to cook for themselves, creating foods that they could eat, and which actually then they found their friends found were actually quite nice. Surprisingly, they weren't disgusting. They were actually rather good, and starting to sell them, and then the ability to actually sell through the internet. I think that was huge. Absolutely huge. And then the supermarkets who adopted yeah. free from very, very early on and were an absolutely crucial, you know, love them or, like, or, or loathe them, you know, they're absolutely crucial in the development. I think that's really interesting. And and we've, we've sort of done a bit of a whistle stop tour of you know, what <laughs> things were like in the middle. <laughs> we've, we've, had, we've had that middle period in terms of the centuries. I'd be interested to hear your opinion on, on where we are now. And in your opinion, what is the biggest obstacle right now for driving free from to the next level, driving it forward? What's the, the biggest thing that, that we sort of need to work on as a, as a community or manufacturers or, or anyone really? Well, I think we need to, as always, work on understanding because allergy and intolerance is an incredibly complicated subject. So we need to work on understanding. We need to work on clear information I think labeling is incredibly important. We've actually added this year, we've added a packaging campaign to the awards. We've also added a, a category for labeling because for anyone with a food issue, and even if it's only actually if they're vegan or even if it's something completely unconnected with allergy, they need to know what's in their food and they need to know exactly what's in their food, not some big, well, there might be some flavorings or something. They actually need to know exactly. What. So I think that's hugely important. I think it's also hugely important that free from remains healthy that it, it still has this aura of being healthier around it and it really has to work at keeping that of course you can have treat foods of course we can have chocolates and things we're not suggesting you shouldn't have any of those but that the overall profile must remain healthy and i think that you know free from manufacturers are pretty good at that and then we just need to get out availability i think is also huge you know i live in london so it's easy i can access all this stuff very easily but if you live in more remote parts of the countryside, that's not at all the case. So I think probably the biggest hurdle really is getting the food out there to into you know petrol stations, getting into places where people go into corner shops, um, into the more remote supermarkets, which are not the big multi supermarkets in, in great big urban areas. So I think that that's that actually is probably the most crucial thing, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. And I can I can second that from running this chat show. I remember right at the start of lockdown, we had people coming on to watch the show and we were asking them to talk about what they were finding most difficult. And we had people in remote locations around the country that were at their wits end trying to access the food that they needed. Luckily, we, we, we got out of the, the other side of that after a month or so. But yeah, that totally, totally fits in with, with my experience of speaking to people that certainly at the start of lockdown. Well, it does. I mean, you know, the fact that you can get so much of the stuff online is enormously helpful, obviously, but it is more expensive and it doesn't come immediately. And as you know, as we know from lockdown and from the whole COVID experience, mm -hmm. you know, 84, what is it, 85 percent or 90 percent of us actually shop in supermarkets. So actually it does need to be there. And, you know, we're all over the country. We're not just all in urban groupings. So it needs to be so pressure on the supermarkets to really stock these foods. I think it's, it's yeah. really important, really, really big. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to ask you one more thing before I let you go. So I know you're very busy. Um, could you uh, tell, us, tell us just a little bit about what you've got coming up? So you've got the website launch and just what, what are you most excited about in the next couple of weeks where, where people can tune into your, to your channels and your websites and see what's going on? Well, certainly our, our website launch is there because we've been working on that over the, over the summer. We've had a rebrand because you know our old branding had been around 14 years and getting a bit long in the tooth so we've got new brand, new logos new website and of course the new awards opening on monday with a lot of quite exciting new categories as i say we've got a new labeling category we've got a new packaging category we've got a category for um best independent brands which we haven't had before and because we're also online aware we've actually got a completely new category we literally only came up with it about 10 days ago for your digital presence. 
because your website and your whole social media presence, particularly for small companies, um, is so crucial and so important that you get it right. That's where you can sell yourself. So we've all that coming up. Um, and we've also just, as I say, yesterday launched our Zoominar program, which is very much a networking program. We feel that we're in a really good position to bring people in the industry together because there's so much collaboration that can be done, particularly between small manufacturers. So many things they can talk to each other about, so many things they can help each other about. All, you know, because what we all want to do is get more of this food out to the people who need it. And so I think we're in a really good position to enable that. So we've got all kinds of plans, which we'll be not going to tell you right now, but they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, that gives me an excuse to get you back on the show, doesn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much for giving up your time today. I really look forward to inviting you back to, to our special episode on the Free From Food Awards. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Bye-bye. Okay, so moving on to our next guest. It's a really good lineup this week. I'd like to welcome to the virtual studio, Stacey Falsey. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, Stacey. Thanks for Hi, sticking around and thanks for giving up your time today. No problem. No problem at so, all. Uh, it was so interesting. Wasn't it? It was really good. Um, yeah, uh, always sort really of start in, in the same to. place. So for mm. anyone that doesn't know your work, could you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and, and your journey? Yes, of course. Um, it was a bit of a strange one, actually, following Michelle, because um, I find myself as a creative, I'm actually an artist um, by trade, and I find myself functioning in this world now of free from and author of um, my book, Scrumptious as Sweet Treats, which is a recipe book. And um, I, I, it's kind of like happened accidentally. It's really strange. So, yes, I'm new to the free from world. I'd say about four or five years, uh, mm -hmm. published my book which is a sweet indulgent recipe book full of free from gluten, dairy, eggs, and no refined sugar recipes. Uh, I published that two years ago, but um, oh, there you go. An attractive <laughs> photo. <laughs> um, yeah, it's actually two years in a couple of weeks that I published my book and still going strong. Oh yeah, there we go. It's my <laughs> website. Yep. But um yeah, some people may know me from the TV show How to Write a Cheshire, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which, God, I think I was on the show for about three and a half years. That's flown mm -hmm. by. Where's that gone? So, yeah, <laughs> um, I joined the show in 2016 and I left the show, God, end of 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. I, I'm lost with time and locked down <laughs> and everything, kind of lost complete perspective of time oh there's me on the bike yes <laughs> uh, there's me in the studio yeah so most people know me from the tv show uh why did i join the tv show I joined the tv show because i'm an artist and i wanted to sell well you know create a platform to sell my artwork and whilst on the show it was then that i began to realize that i had well to be fair before the show um i started having symptoms of um got health issues mm -hmm. and slowly discovered that I couldn't eat gluten and, and dairy became a problem for me. So whilst filming and on the TV show, um, I was struggling with loads of health issues, to be fair, um, all down to diet. And, and then my diet became slowly restricted. And then through testing, uh, I found out that my daughter was suffering with the same issues as myself. And she became gluten intolerant. And um, dairy intolerance and I'm lactose intolerant and and so behind the scenes I was suffering health wise quite badly so that kind of inspired me then to um, to write the recipe book which um, which I published two years ago and I'm now in That's this really world of free from yeah well this is it isn't it and I think like it's really interesting yeah. to hear different people's stories about how how they came to it and and it's interesting mm. to to hear the way you obviously sort of already had a platform through being on the TV show and your artwork and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. it obviously mm. became quite a personal passion for you to decide to use that platform to to, to work yeah. in the area of free from, which which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, no yeah, worries. it's been a hell of a journey, it really has. Um, you know, and for me, 
it's um i don't have any food allergies they're mainly it's due to um certain illnesses that i have and which has led me to not be able to have a completely normal diet and i'm i'm, I'm just so restricted on what i can eat which then kind of opened up this world of realizing how many people have to have alternative diets and how difficult it is to find food that's still mm. um that's not compromised on taste and texture and um and then when you've got a child that's growing and just wants to eat sweet treats and they can't have dairy hence no ice cream and chocolate and and gluten and it's just so restrictive for them and uh, as an adult i was prepared to just you know live with it but then when you have a child and a, a growing girl, a teenager, um, who you don't want to then create um, dietary issues, food related issues at the same time. It's it, yeah, it's been a real journey. So, um, you know, I wanted to create sweet treats for her just as much as myself that um, weren't compromised in taste and texture and, and also were healthy, which is what Michelle has just been talking about, you know, the health aspect yeah. as well being really important so that's when the no refined sugar came into it as well mm. okay that's interesting and as, as someone who's sort yeah. of been involved with the free from community for for a few years but not many many years what's your sort of impressions of the community I, i've i've only really been involved professionally since last november when i joined uh okay. when i joined the allergy mm. show and what i've really been taken aback by is how supportive everyone is how how mm. vibrant the community is with sharing recipes and advice and stuff like that is that something that yes. is your experience it's been similar oh massively definitely um and i think you know to be within a community of people that have created small businesses, people that have created all these different various products and, and written books like myself, the passion that goes behind it and the creativity that's behind it is just, that's driven by a need to help others and not so much driven by a monetary um, it, mm -hmm. value. You, you know, it's just, it's really refreshing to know that everybody wants to help each other and, and has found uh new ways of um giving people more variety to their diets that are restricted um and it mm -hmm. comes with passion and um and the, just the need to help which is really nice and yeah everybody's yeah, very really supportive cool. so many people very. share my links and um anything that i do within the community yeah very very supportive i agree mm. Yeah, something I've enjoyed asking pretty much everyone that I've interviewed over the last few months is uh, mm. basically what 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 has the last few months been like for you? Because we've all had a fair amount of time on our hands, fair amount of time at yeah. home. Yeah, uh, a lot of people have talked about it being good time for recipe development, that sort of thing. How, how have yeah. you spent the 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 period of time where we've all all spent a lot more time at home than than we perhaps would have normally? Yeah, yeah. Well. Um... And there's an element of guilt in saying this, but I found um, lockdown really enjoyable from the perspective of creating new recipes and and just being able to sit down, look at my website and reconnect and develop and think and um, drive um, the recipes forward. So I've been working on a, a jam roly poly. So that's one thing I did in lockdown. And I'm also working on... Um, turning some of my recipes into product. So I'm starting okay. with the sticky toffee pudding and the caramel sauce, which is completely gluten, dairy free, egg free, and no refined sugar. So I'm kind of, it's trial and error at the moment, really, trying to work out the shelf life and, um, mm. and all the complications that come with it, trying to find people to help me with the nutritional breakdown and designing the packaging and, and coming from a creative background is something that I'm able to do myself. So I've been designing packaging mm -hmm. and, and so yeah, new recipes developing recipes into products which i would love to have on the supermarket shelves as michelle has just been saying and um yeah i've been developing another business which is an art related business as well but i won't bore you with that mm -hmm. uh, but that's all charity led um so that's been really exciting but uh, i got involved with nhs meals online as well i tried to um 
I created some discounts on my website so that people could go on and purchase the book at a huge discount. And, and one pound from every sale of the book went towards um, an HS field online. So that was that was oh, great. Really and, nice. and to be fair, I'm, I'm still uh, the, the discount still there. So it's just mm -hmm. to help anybody in the community, really, although the charity has now ceased because we're no lo longer in not lockdown. Um, I've kept the, the you'll see help support uh, 20. If you pop that code in before you buy the book, you get 20 percent off. And I, I've kept it there because I feel as though we kill, still kind of are in lockdown, so to speak. Uh, and I think people still need help financially. So, yeah. That's still there. Amazing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah. I was going to ask so, sort of yeah. what's next on the horizon Busy. for you because you seem like someone who's always always got a few projects on the go by the sounds of it. Yeah. So oh God, so what honestly. we need so we want to be looking out for products really based on on yes. the sort of recipes from your book. Yeah. That's that's your next endeavor. Yeah, that's in my next. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely love this side of Christmas to have the mm -hmm. sticky toffee pudding rolling out. That's that's the goal, really. But um, the way things are going, it's been a little bit slower than I expected. Um, it's been a harder process than I expected. So, and I just want it to be spot on. And mm. so, yeah, that's that's what's next in the pipeline, really, with regards to the book. Cool. And I would absolutely love to... Um, create some savory recipes you know to mm. i love good old-fashioned i'm a real foodie and uh, i think mm. when when i was told i couldn't eat gluten and dairy anymore and, and and various other foods um i've made it my mission in life to still create food that's good old-fashioned british traditional mm -hmm. recipes recreated but with alternative ingredients that still taste the same and, and you're not compromising on taste and texture which you know is the aim of most of us in the free from world so if i can yeah. develop things like a, good, a nice pie and yorkshire pudding um then that would be amazing but no product next so i want to get the product on the uh supermarket awesome. shelf so yeah, awesome. fingers well, crossed. Good, good luck. Fingers crossed. Hope so. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. And if people want to sort of keep an eye on you and, and what you're up to to see how that develops, where can they find you online? So um, I've just created a YouTube channel. So mm -hmm. uh, if you go to my Instagram account or my Facebook account, um, you can see my YouTube channel on there. And I think we launched, God, five, six weeks ago now. So there's um, there's lots of baking on there. You can see my health journey and the diagnosis that I received as to why I'm eating a diet with alternative um, ingredients and, and I can't have the gluten and the dairy. Uh, yep, there's the Instagram page and also my website, which is Stacey40, uh, sorry, www.stacey40.co.uk. So, yeah, okay. YouTube channel and my website, everything's on there. Lovely. Okay, well, thanks so much for spending a bit of time with oh, us today. Oh, no, thank you, Ben. Yeah, I'll <laughs> stay on and, and keep listening. No worries. Okay, thanks a lot, Anna, and please come back. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, bye. Okay, so finally today, we have a long-term friend of the show who's recorded a special cook-along for us, but I believe Becky is here watching. So uh, we've got Becky XL's cook-along now coming up, and she's going to be in the comments. So if you guys have got any questions about her recipe, as you watch along at home, pop them in the comments and Becky will get back to you and, and answer any questions you've got. So yeah, without any further ado, I'm going to move on to the cook along with Becky. Hey everyone, Becky here. Today I'm going to be doing a recipe demo for you, a recipe that I hope you'll like because I really, really love, and that is for gluten-free donuts. These are filled donuts, so they can be filled with jam, they can be filled with custard, they can be filled with apple, they can be filled with chocolate, whatever you fancy. I haven't actually decided what I'm going to fill mine with yet, but Keep tuned, I guess, and you'll see by the end of the video. Um, I'll put the ingredients on the screen somewhere here right now so that you can cook along or you just need to know what's in them. Whatever, all that jazz. Um, and if you don't know who I am, my name is Becky XL. Um, I run a blog called Gluten Free Cup of Tea where I post lots of different recipes. So you can go and check that out if you fancy, but maybe after this video because I kind of like you to watch it. I'd like some people to look at it. <laughs> um, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. So first things first, we're gonna put all our dry ingredients into our big bowl. So that is our gluten-free self-raising flour. Put that in. 
We're going to put our xanthan gum in. If you don't have xanthan gum, then that is okay because there's usually xanthan gum in your self-raising flour anyway, but I just like to put a little bit extra in. Then we're going to put our sugar into here. This is caster sugar, but you could also use like granulated sugar. I haven't tried it with brown sugar before, but ideally caster sugar because that's what I'm using. And then finally, get a little bit of cinnamon and put that in because cinnamon just works so well when it comes to donuts. So I'm just going to mix it all together and then put it to one side as we need to sort out all our wet ingredients, which I will show you in a super quick second. There we go. I'm making a mess. Um, so I'll put that there. Now in this bowl, we're going to put all our wet ingredients. So that will be our two eggs, which you can now watch me crack and see if I massively fail when I'm doing this on camera. There we go. Winner. And a second one. And then our other ingredients are, we've got some oil here. This is just a plain like flavorless oil. So like a vegetable oil, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, anything like that. Preferably not like a garlic infused oil because we don't want garlic jam donuts. Um, and then I have got some melted butter, which I melted ages ago. So it's going a bit stiff now, but you want it to be cool. You don't want it to be hot. So you don't want to do it straight out the microwave into here because otherwise it'll cook the eggs. So just pour that in, get it all out. Oops. Then also we want to put in a little bit of vanilla. So let me just get that for you. There we go. Bit of vanilla extract. And finally, the last ingredient is something that I've made up just in advance, about 10 minutes ago. Um, this is buttermilk. You can obviously buy buttermilk, but this is homemade buttermilk. So all I've done here is get some milk and put a tablespoon of lemon juice into that, mix it up, leave it for 10 minutes, and it becomes this sort of curdled mess, which is what buttermilk essentially is. Now you can do this with regular like cow's milk if you want, you can use lactose free milk, you can use dairy free milk, so you can use your almond milk, your soy milk, whatever you want. Um, doesn't really matter, just leave it for 10 minutes and you'll maybe see when I put it in how it looks a bit weird. I mean, you can kind of see now, it doesn't look like the sort of milk you'd want to put in your tea or your coffee. Um, so I'm just going to add that in and then I'll mix all of these together with a different spatula very quickly, um, just so that the eggs are broken up and it's all nicely combined. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna, it's so simple, we're just gonna add this to that dry bowl and then you're done. That is literally your donut batter, as it were. It's not really a batter, it's more like a sort of cake mixture consistency um, because at the end of the day, a baked donut, did I say these are baked donuts? They're not fried donuts. So what you ordinarily think of when you think of donuts is a really sort of, greasy fried donut. That is what we all sort of miss, isn't it? But trust me, these baked donuts have such a good texture and such a good taste that I don't think you'll be too bothered that they're not fried. Plus, I mean, I'm not all into this healthy jazz. Guess I should be a little bit, but I'm not a big health freak. Um, so I don't really mind, but baked are healthier because you're not putting them in loads of oil, you're not submerging them in oil for ages. So that is all you need to do with your wet ingredients. And then we'll get our big old boy of dry ingredients in. And we'll literally just pour this bowl, this one, into this and we'll mix it. But what I must emphasize is that you don't want to overmix it. A bit like a bit like muffins, if you know how you make sort of blueberry muffins or chocolate chip muffins or something, you really don't want to over mix these two once they're put together. You can mix this all you want, the dry, and you can mix this all you want, the wet, separately. But once you put them together, you want to really do it just very, very quickly. Um, I'll show you how quick I mean, because if you don't, you'll find that your, your donuts will come out fairly tough and just not the consistency that you want them to. So I'll put this in. There we go. Looks a lovely old mixture at the moment, doesn't it? Um, and I'll just sort of mix it round and it will look like it's not gonna come together. It will look like it's gonna be lumpy, but it won't. And as you can see, I'm just using my spatula. I'm not using like an electric hand mixer, um, which I really don't recommend using stand mixers or electric hand whisks or whatever when you're making something like this or muffins, as I said, because you don't want to over mix it. You just wanna keep it very much just mix so you don't want to see any pockets of flour but you don't want it to be absolutely blitzed because that ain't gonna work 
Um, also, whilst I'm mixing this, I've already preheated my oven. It's on at 160 degrees C fan, which is 180 degrees C, which if you want to know as well, is 350 degrees Fahrenheit. I always know the Fahrenheit thing because people always ask me. So that is pretty much done. You can see that it's just like sort of a nice batter consistency now. And we're just going to put it into a tin. So these donuts are actually made in muffin or cupcake tins. Um, that gives them their shape. Although obviously it gives it a slight sort of muffiny cupcake shape. Not really. Um, so one second, I just need to go and get my cupcake tin because it's on the other side of the room. Right, so this is what you need, cupcake tin. I've greased this with just some sort of oil spray that I used for greasing my tins. Um, this is like, I think it's a muffin tin. So they're a bit deeper than cupcakes. They're not like a bun tin. I get confused with all these different ones, but basically this is what it looks like. Very simple. And I'm just gonna fill these up. Okay, so I have got my tin and I'm just going to literally fill these all the way up to the top with my mixture. Now, if you have looked at this recipe before on my blog, because it's it's fairly popular, um, then you'll have seen, and you might have tried making them where you fill half of the mixture up, then you put like some jam or some chocolate in the middle and then fill the rest up and then you cook them with the filling in. However, I thought I'd just show you today my other way of doing it, which is also on the blog, because I give you two options, because I'm nice like that. Um, and this way for me, is probably the best way to get ultimate like distribution of jam and whatever filling you want. You want to have loads and loads. You want to bite into your donut and it ooze with jam. You don't want just a little bit because then that's just a bit depressing, isn't it? So basically what I do is I fill these almost to the top and they'll get a really nice like rise on them. And then we can pipe in the jam or whatever you want, the custard. Um, afterwards and honestly I always in the past before I really got into my baking the word piping just scared me I was like I can't do that but when you're literally just piping stuff into the middle of a donut it's fine trust me it does not it doesn't matter if it gets messy it really doesn't um, and even if you don't have a piping bag you can use like a plastic bag or something um, and you can kind of make your own not that I've ever tried but I know that's something you can do um, so yeah, I'm just gonna fill these, these babies all up and they're gonna go in for between 18 to 20 minutes. Basically, you want to see them get a little bit of colour, you want to see them rise a little bit, um, you'll know when they're done, but if they're, if you want to double check or something like that, then just use a little skewer just to go through it and see, but you really don't want to overbake them, so I tend to check at 18 minutes, but if you can really tell, like, all ovens are different. Like, it's not like you've done something wrong sometimes. Always blame your oven, don't blame yourself. So 18 to 20 minutes, and then I'll be back. So in three, two, one. So you probably thought that you were gonna get a magical treat whereby donuts were unbaked and then they instantly baked on the screen, and that would be great. Instead, you've got my face. Um, but that's because I was just gonna say, if anyone's got any uh, like questions or anything then you can leave them in a comment box somewhere on the screen if you're watching it live because I'm I'm here um, to answer any questions you have if you're watching this after the live show then you can always message me you can leave a comment on here still or you can dm me on social media or just send me a comment or something all my social media um, handles are just at Becky Excel anyway I've now got to do some washing up I'm back and they are out of the oven. Here they are. Well, I've got loads of them, but those are the ones I'm going to show you right now. Um, so as you can see, they kind of do look a bit like muffin shape, but they smell like a donut. And what's going to make them smell even more and taste even more like a donut is the coating. So I have got some melted butter here. I've also got some granulated sugar and granulated sugar is a bit more uh, it's not so fine as caster sugar. So I find it's a really good coating for donuts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip each of my little donuts in some of the butter then I'm going to put it into the sugar and they'll come out looking like really really cute little donuts and then as the butter is actually warm because that helps them all stick I'll just leave them briefly for a few seconds and then we will pipe our filling in which is the exciting bit and then it'll be done and then I'll be able to eat them and then I'll let you go so yeah I'll just do this now
Okay, so I'm not going to bore you by literally coating all of these, but I just thought I'd show you a couple just so that you get the idea. It's quite simple. So we're just coating them in this butter. This is melted butter and it's warm. If you don't want to use butter because you're dairy-free or vegan, then you could use just a baking block or vegan butter or whatever. So coat it like that. Then just brush it all around. You could use a spoon to sprinkle it all over the top if you wanted, but why not get your hands messy um, and put it in like that. And there you go. That's done. So I'll do it once more. Not that you didn't see that, but you can see the difference now. That does look kind of like more donut like. So just put it in the butter, mix it all around, put it in the flour, and it becomes a donut. It turns from a muffin thing into a donut, and it tastes like one all the way through. So there you go. There's uh, a couple of them done. And now I just need to let them slightly cool down because of the warm butter. So I'll just get on with doing the rest of these and then BRB, we will pipe in some lovely filling and sugary fingers. Uh. Okay, so the time has come, it's piping time. So I've got some jam in this piping bag. And then because I couldn't make my mind up, I've also got custard in this piping bag. And basically what I'm gonna do is, let's get this one as an example. This is my donut. I am going to, you can do this in a number of ways. Obviously, like I said, you can put the jam or custard in the center and then cook it into the donut, but this way you get more. So you can either pipe from the top like that. You can pipe in the bottom like that. Or what I'm gonna show you today is just pipe in the side. So I'm gonna push it in, wiggle it in, and then I'll just keep piping until you get this little sort of like blob that comes out, which shows that it's full to bursting and you can't get any more custard or jam or whatever in so I'll do that now I'll show you I won't just let you look at my face um <laughs> so yeah switch camera okay so I'll just quickly show you how to pipe into them so you're just going to pipe into the side so in this little bit just push this in be really gentle with it and then just squeeze and squeeze until the jam starts to come out so then you know that you've filled up your donut so keep squeezing keep squeezing and then as it starts to come out, there you go. You know that you've got a, a little jammy donut filled with jam. And then you do exactly the same for your custard ones. So I'm going to do that now. And then I'll show you the beautiful filling, shall I? Okay, so I thought I'd show you one of the custard ones and one of the jam ones once you cut them open. Lots of nice filling. And that's all because you've really piped really deep into them. Um, they honestly, they're just, so simple to make as I hope you've seen. Really, really, really delicious. And if you've been missing donuts like I have, like I've been gluten free for 11 years and I miss donuts. So to be able to make some at home really, really quickly is just the best thing in the world. So I think I might eat these now. Anyway, I think that's all from me today. So I really hope you've enjoyed this sort of very brief, but hopefully useful and interesting and yummy uh, recipe demo. Um, these just, I mean, look, it's just cool. It's just awesome. I never thought that this was possible. I'll make sure that the full recipe is linked somewhere below to the side up. I don't know where. Or you can just find it on my blog, glutenfreecupofteauk Um, But yeah, thank you again for watching. If you've got any questions, you can leave them around comments if there is a space for that. Um, otherwise, just message me. All my social media channels are at Becky Excel. So wherever suits you, um, you can speak to me. I'm always there. <laughs> um, that being said, I hope everyone has a lovely weekend. I hope the sun keeps shining. Fingers crossed, probably won't, but whatever. Um, and I'll see you all soon. Bye. Okay, thanks so much for that, Becky. Thanks for recording that for us. I am very partial to a muffin, a donut, and indeed a duffin. So I'm definitely going to uh, give that one a try. Uh, just want to say thank you to all of our guests. I think we might pop them back on now. So we can wave goodbye. We're on CBBC. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, everyone. We'll be we'll be back uh, next month, third Friday. We're always on the third Friday of each month at half three. So I'll see you all then and look out to see who the guests are going to be. But until next time, stay safe, free from us. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ben.